Hello and welcome back from lunch. I hope you had a good break and you had some coffee that's going to keep you from the graveyard shift as we go into the second segment of our Design Futures Forum 2023. Now, the second segment today, we're going to talk about designing for the future of emerging technology. And leading us for this segment is none other than Dr. Ming Tan, founding executive director of Tech for Good Institute. Now, the Tech for Good Institute, if you haven't heard of them, it's a non-profit founded to catalyze research and collaboration on social, economic, and policy trends accelerated by the digital economy in Southeast Asia. Now, Dr. Matan is concurrently a senior fellow at the Center for Governance and Sustainability at the National University of Singapore. And if that's not enough, she's also advisor to the founder of the Como Group, a Singaporean lifestyle company with an international portfolio. Now, Ming, on top of that, was previously Managing Director of IPOS International, which is part of the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore. Ming, the stage is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch. Dawn's just put a very formidable challenge in front of us, which is keeping you engaged after lunch. Welcome to Design for the Future of Emerging Tech. As Dawn mentioned, I'm Ming. I've had many, many different um, hats that I've worn, um, and I'd be the first to admit that I'm not a designer. I started as an engineer who somehow ended up with a doctorate in history. So that's a doctor part, so if you need a doctor in an air, on an aeroplane, please don't come to me. <laughs> but I moved from engineering to history for two reasons. The first is I realized that engineering could solve problems, but it was people who defined the problems. An Israeli professor once said to me, Ming, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. We ran, we, the Stone Age ended because with ingenuity and creativity, we found better ways to meet our needs. So maybe Catherine's Flintstones future isn't so bad after all if we can do this with ingenuity and creativity. So whether a design or engineer a good solution starts with identifying the problem and understanding the problem. The second, I realized that technological innovation had impact only if you could drive adoption for your new idea. As Don mentioned, I was managing director of IPOS International, which is part of the IP office of Singapore. The designers here may have worked with the IP office for registration of trade, trademark, copyright, or your designs. Now, the patent register, which is where the tech site comes in, is full of novel inventions. But many of them never made it to market, never saw the light of day. So the challenge is not just to create something new, but whether you can get people to believe in it. Can you get people to move away from an old habit to a new way of doing things? to get people to stake their own personal or professional credibility to advocate for your innovation to others. And even if you succeed in all of that, can you be sure that your innovation has had, a has had net positive impact on people and planet? Minimizing potential negative impact while maximizing positive impact is really tough. And we know that technology, and digital technology in particular, has great potential to drive economic growth. But at the same time, we have seen technology's impact, which is social, cultural, and political. So for example, you might say technology has been fantastic at preserving culture, helps archiving in museums, but other people will say technology effaces diversity and overshadows local traditions and values. Some people will say technology has the potential to bring people together. A lot of the social media sites will say that. And other people feel that technology has increased isolation and brought about very real concerns over personal data. Technology can facilitate policy making and make better public services with better data for decision making and we can serve our citizens better. At the same time, you have technology and as a result, misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation contributing to the increasing polarization of public discourse. So that's why I'm really happy to be here today on the, design, the designing for the future of emerging tech. 
It's great that tech shares the day with sustainability in the morning and care later, because I really feel that Design SG's three topics, focus on these three topics is absolutely spot on. First, you target the big challenges and opportunities. Climate change at the planetary scale that we heard of this morning, tech at a global scale, and then care at the social and community scale. I think it's also very appropriate that tech is sandwiched between sustainability and care. We're like the icing inside the Oreo cookie, yeah? Or the kaya in your toast, right? We need the digital transition to enable all the other transitions we have to achieve in this decade. Transiting to a low carbon or circular economy or enabling better systems of care. Many of your basic enabling technologies, whether it's mobile, cloud, Wi-Fi, secure data storage, systems, data flows, internet of things, sensors, and of course, AI, all of this feed into enabling these futures. So design as a practice, as well as a process, helps us define the problems to which we apply these technologies. Design enables the adoption of new technology by keeping the human at the center of new products and services. While tech disrupts established economic and social structures, it is really important that we rem remember that it is not the tech companies who decide on the future of emerging tech. And that's what the Tech for Good Institute is all about. Society can and must shape the trajectory of technical innovation. It is people who will decide where funding goes. It is people who will decide how to develop and design products and services. It, will, it is people who, legislators and public servants, who will enable, govern, and regulate tech. And it is as consumers, we decide what services to consume that will shape the way we work, we live, we play, we learn, or even find love. The stakes are really high. We sit in a region of Southeast Asia with really rapid digital transformation. Southeast Asia has 460 million internet users, of whom 100 million of these only came online in the last three years. In our region, we have over 100 ethnicities, and we speak over 1,000 languages, and yet, 60% of the world's online data is in English. How do we design emerging tech to improve quality of life for all while respecting the diversity of ways of life that we celebrate? So for our session today, we have put together three speakers who are absolutely fantastic in their own rights, but they don't always share the stage. And they are all in their own domains, shaping our experience of emerging tech. We will hear from each one of them individually on their vision for a digital future and the role of design in emerging tech to enable that future. And then after their presentations, we'll come together in a panel and then leave some time for questions. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Cheng Kai Fong, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Communication and Information. He holds the positions of Permanent Secretary of Smart Nation and Digital Government Group and Permanent Secretary Development Cybersecurity in the Prime Minister's Office, and yet previously served on economic ministries such as the Ministry of Trade and Industry and, formerly, and was the former Managing Director of Singapore's EDB. So with his many, many multiple hats, Mr. Chung takes a systems view of the role of technology in the evolution of Singapore's government economy, and society. And for a separate fun fact, Mr. Cheng is also an arts lover. He plays a euphonium. Hands up. Those who know what a euphonium is? Very few people. I'll leave it to Mr. Cheng to explain and is on the board of the Singapore Symphony Orchestra. Kai Fong, please. Thanks, Ming. This uh, picture is on the landing page of the Smart Nation and Digital Government Office website. It's a picture that connotes the future of Singapore, uh, encapsulates what design means to Singapore in our urban design, the Marina Bay, but you know, tries to be a bit futuristic 
with the light come emanating from the center. But I often get asked, uh, what is Smart Nation all about? And the next video I'm going to show you, perhaps is what people think Smart Nation is all about. It's a video that I took with my son uh, when I went to the LKY 100 exhibition uh, over the weekend. And uh, have a look. So this is supposed to be Singapore in 100 years' time. <laughs> That's the DBS Tower. We are pretending to wave at the crowds. Uh, I think there are like HDB flats behind. Uh, that's the new gardens by the bay. It's become a vertical garden. And I think, I hope you are not expecting me to show you grandiose visions of what Singapore might look like or how a smart nation uh, might evolve. Uh, that we will leave to my, the next speaker, Deb, who is from NVIDIA. Uh, these, this video is probably rendered by some of his GPUs. But if I ask civil servants what uh, smart nation is, this is the other picture that they will show. Grand plans. Right, schematics, a master plan for national digital identity, a master plan for e-payments, how, how we're going to get rid of cash. But actually today, uh, even as we talk about design and tech, I want to get down to basics. I'm inspired by this quote by Picasso, which is that when art critics get together, they talk about form, structure, and meaning. But when artists get together, they talk about where you can buy cheap turpentine because it's the means that really matter. And today, I want to take you through to what I think is the most high-tech of what we've done so far. The humble QR code and the physical vouchers that we print out. And I'm going to walk through that process. Uh, and I did not do this, but a team of ours under Open Government Products developed this product. And I'm sure many of you are already using it. After all, it's free money from government. Everyone gets $300 to spend uh, at Hawker Centers. I'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to show you the principles behind designing that and what it really means when we talk about a smart nation, what it really means when we talk about design and emerging tech. So let's start. This is Redeem SG, Singapore's voucher system. Can I have a show of hands? How many people have actually used Redeem SG? Well, the stats don't bear out because actually 95% of vouchers have been claimed. <laughs> So either you're foreigners or... Yeah. But just to recap, uh, this happened during COVID, and I think we were, as policymakers, we had two aims, right? One, uh, local businesses were struggling, so we need to find a way to give them some money. But two, residents were also struggling. So this team came up with a digital voucher system. We call it Redeem SG. Actually, vouchers are present in almost everywhere of the world, right, where you need to do transfers. You give vouchers so that you can spend on particular uh, food items or particular items. Uh, you can't spend on cigarettes, you can't spend on alcohol, let's say. And it's targeted. And so far, by the stats, 95% of households have claimed. And they spent uh, 500 over a million dollars. And this is a wild success. If you think about it, if you think about Singapore from old to young, every household, uh, the utilization rate is a sign of success. Now, how did this come about? It came about starting with a trip to the hawker centre, and you realise during COVID, the hawkers were all uh, suffering. And the previous way in which we did it was extremely inefficient, time-intensive and problematic. We used to give out physical CDC vouchers like these. Now, there were several problems, right? One, distribution was inefficient. You basically got postmen, you printed out all these vouchers, you put it in the letter boxes, and the cost of distributing those letter boxes and printing those vouchers were probably more than the cost of the vouchers itself. And then this was also susceptible to theft. So people actually broke open letter boxes and took it. And you know, you can just imagine a lot more problems. But more than that, right? Uh, we tried other means. We said, why not go to a community center and, and pick them up? But again, that wasn't viable during COVID. And if you are elderly or you're infirm, it's going to be really difficult to pick up those vouchers. Spending and accepting was also inconvenient, right? Because you've got to keep those vouchers, you've got to store them, you've got to put it in your pocket. Plenty of logistical issues to sort out. But the worst of all was how the collection was laborious and slow. And this blew the minds of the team at OGP. Basically, what happened was that they had people going store to store, collecting vouchers, recording it in 
a table. And then three to four weeks later, they will reconcile it at the banks, and then the money will be paid later. That's completely ridiculous. Now, so this was the problem they tried to solve. How do we distribute vouchers to everyone to give them help, but at the same time make sure they are used? This was the result, and this is the end product. And you can look at the end product, and you can see, right? On the left-hand side, you have digital vouchers. You have a QR code, which the merchant scans, and then you pay. Now, if you look at this as a design point of view, it's very strange, isn't it? It looks so laborious. After all, you're using the emerging tech, right? You're using an iPhone, right? Why is it that in this day and age, you use an iPhone, you still have physical vouch you still have vouchers in denominations? Very strange, isn't it? Two, in most countries, including Singapore, you will scan to pay. Why is it in this case, the merchant scans to pay rather than the user scans to pay? It seems awfully clunky to me. But these were design decisions that the team made to, to, to make sure we get 95 to 100% adoption. And I'm going to walk you through very quickly a series. So, so the whole point of this is to make sure no one gets left behind as we talk about design, as we talk about tech. Now, how did the team land on this? Just a series of experiments which I'm going to run through in quick detail. Firstly, they looked at conventional payment flows. And so, I, I mentioned earlier, you scan a QR code and pay. Right? So that's the source. So you, you scan, you key in the amount, and you pay for the food. Now, that seemed easy, right? But actually, if you think about it, it's very, very difficult for old people to do. They, may, they are worried about pressing the wrong numbers. Uh, they have to download an app. That's a problem. And so at the end of the day, they realized this isn't a very good solution. So the, the team went down to the hawker centers, they experimented, they tried it at the hawkers, and what they decided would work, what, would work was we could send vouchers via SMS links because everyone uh, had the mobile phone. We get them to download, we don't need a mobile app, so that's great. But what they realized was getting them to scan the QR code was bad because not everyone knew how to give permissions on the phone to use your camera. And so that's wrong. They threw that away. Next experiment. So how do you go beyond scanning? So the team thought, okay, maybe let's give each chicken rice stall a, a number, and then you input the number. That's, that's easier, right? So they, they followed this voucher. You enter the number. Again, super laborious. In a small phone, the elderly can't do that. But they went down to try anyway. And as a result, okay, we, we stick to the first. We still send vouchers by SMS, no mobile apps. But inputting precise digits was a no-no if you want to reach out to 100% of the population. So, back to the drawing board. Let's look at the paper QR code. Right? So people found it to be useful because actually it's straightforward, intuitive. Aha! So that's what you want to go down. The route you want to go down is a firm familiarity paper voucher flow. So this eventually became the solution, a digital voucher that we scan. And the beauty of this, and this is why this is an innovation, is that for the elderly, they can get their friends to print out, they can get their family to print out, they can go to the community center to print out these physical vouchers, and they would be entitled to use these vouchers as well. So imagine, if you came thinking that high tech is going to solve the problem, no. Actually, low tech solves the problem. But it takes a series of experiments and a series of trials to make magic happen. And we've now got about 98% of vouchers which are claimed, 100 million spent just within the launch, and we've now run, ran three additional campaigns. And if you think about it, this is just the germ and the seed of a much larger fiscal policy instrument that we have now. Because imagine we now have a payment voucher system that can be used to target for specific spending. And this, in effect, enables micro fiscal policy easily and effectively, and actually is the foundation piece for many of the payment initiatives, many of the smart nation initiatives. So what's the moral of the story? I think the moral of the story is that design and tech is really a movement for us. It's about building a culture of experimentation in government. It's about going to the public 
to look for, look for products to build, to look for solutions to build, not coming up with a master plan of the smart nation. This is why the team, Open Government Products, every year for a month, does a hackathon. And 80%, I'd say 70 to 80% of their product roadmap comes from the hackathon, looking for problems to solve. In fact, it's so successful that they, they launched Build for Good, which is inviting the public to co-create with them to solve problems. It all starts with just one experiment, and all of you here, I hope, can be inspired to design uh, for public good. And as a result of this approach, uh, we have rolled out many, many different products to solve many different problems, and I'm not going to go through them in detail. But of course, there's the obligatory, what are you doing with AI? And here, I just wanted to, again, share the same approach that we have taken to roll out chat GPT type capabilities in the public government, in, in the government. We call it PAIR. Again, this happened during uh, the hackathon. And essentially, we wanted a chat GPT equivalent that was safe, that was secure, and that can be used and empower every public servant uh, to do their work better. We've even taken this one step further after solving the first problem. Uh, we've now developed an email-based assistant. So instead of just going through a chatbot, you will send, send an email, say, generate a list of FAQs, or summarize this document, and the intern in, behind the scenes in the email address would uh, reply to you. Uh, we can even enable our officers to create custom assistance for common queries. So, again, it boils down to this simple thing, right? What is the problem that you see in your society that you want to solve? This is the movement that we in government are trying to make, are trying to drive uh, at the smart nation. Because ultimately, when PM launched the smart nation, he said, being a smart nation is not about gadgets, it's not about gizmos, it's about solving problems and making a positive difference to people's lives. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kai Fong, for bringing us through. I thought it was absolutely fantastic that you actually took us through a actual project and a really inspiring question to end us with. What is the problem you see in the society that you and I want to solve? From the national view, what we will hear next is Deb Goswami from one of the companies that is developing technology at the forefront of artificial intelligence computing. In his role for NVIDIA's accelerated data science and machine learning developer practice in Asia Pacific, South, Australia, and New Zealand, Deb is passionate about supporting the developer ecosystem in the AI journey. Deb has over a decade of expertise in scaling and enabling enterprise AI in the region across many, many sectors, including media, commerce, ad tech, telcos, oil and gas. So Deb, the floor is yours to tell us about the future uh, from your perspective. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ming. Um, Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> um, I too am not somebody you want to speak to if you have a medical emergency in a play. So just throwing that out there. Um, so I'm with uh, a company called NVIDIA. We're, we're a small startup. Uh, we try and do a bit of good uh, for the world. Um, and I think I have one of the more interesting roles uh, for the company. What I get to do is uh, go out and speak to what we call developers across Asia, across ANZ, and figure out what are you doing? What are you building? What are your problems? Right? So a lot of people um, think of NVIDIA today as a uh, GPU company, as, as a gaming company. And I thought it would be a good idea to kind of level set uh, some of that journey, what it is that we actually do today. Um, and hopefully give you some perspective as to how we've been building a lot of the future along with the world's largest companies. Right? So I think one of the comments that uh, Kai made was the vouchers that the Singapore government doled out couldn't really be used for cigarettes and alcohol. I suspect you couldn't really use them to buy the NVIDIA GPUs either. Yeah? So, um, but in any case, I think um, there are three parts to how NVIDIA operates. Uh, there's the bedrock, the foundation, which is our hardware, we, which are all the chips that many of you are aware of. Um, the more interesting thing is that we actually have a pretty sophisticated software layer that sits on top of this. And this is something that has been built over the last 
20 years. So when, if you speak to Jensen, if any of you get a chance to have a conversation with him, and he's, he's very approachable, so just drop an email, um, he'll tell you we're an accelerated computing company. About 30 years ago, uh, in fact, 1993 was when uh, NVIDIA was formed, uh, I think six months before the launch of the CD-ROM. Yeah, so that kind of goes to show, for some of you young people in the audience, it was a shiny metal disc that you could put inside computers. It had a, computers had a drawer. You could put the metal disc inside that, and, and, and you could play music and all kinds of really, you could have one whole movie in, in one of these metal discs, would you believe, right? So, so at that particular point in time, uh, the only uh, workload that seemed ripe for acceleration was this 3D graphics uh, thing. You know, gaming companies and movie studios were grappling with what people were going to do with this shiny new metal disk in their computers. And over time, that pivoted into data centers. It pivoted into building massive clusters for uh, movies. So if you've watched Shrek, if you've watched Trolls 2, those th movies were rendered on 1,000 node GPU clusters, and they take about 60 to 70 physical days to render. Now, if you're kind of selling clusters of that size, you'd better have the software to go with it. So the NVIDIA software layer was designed to run complex, heavy workloads at scale. So 30 years since the advent of uh, neural networks by Jeffrey Hinton and um, Jan LeCun, they became a reality when they realized that NVIDIA could, and our cards could be used to accelerate AI research. Over the last decade or so, what's happened is we've actually spread that umbrella. So today, you can run pretty much any AI work stream on an NVIDIA card, which brings us to the top of the pyramid. So NVIDIA looks at our verticals across three spaces, three spaces, right? So there's the AI vertical, which a lot of you might know about. There is the digital twins vertical, or the metaverse vertical, which I will actually be focusing on for the rest of the session. And then we have the high performance computing, which actually goes and plays a role into things like climate change, sustainability, astronomy, and, and so on, okay? So one of the things that takes a lot of people by surprise is for NVIDIA, making the chip is step three. Step one, is having a very, very keen ear close to the ground and seeing who's doing what with technology. Which means that for NVIDIA, the generative AI boom, which some of you may have heard of, ChatGPT, I think really spearheaded that when they launched late last year. Um, we've been working on generative AI for the past five years, which is why our ecosystem of over 1,600 partners means that uh, if you're working on generative AI today, chances are you're working with one of our partners or with us directly, okay? What I'm about to show you is, is a cute little video. And the way to think of this is as a future of human-computer interaction. You're about to see a scene where a human player walks into a digital ramen store and he's accepting a mission. He's a bartender, he's fully robotic, so his intelligence, his animation, his speech, they're all rendered in real time, they're generated in real time, and visualize or think of how that means for a future economy or a future uh, engagement model, where next time you pick up the phone or put on your VR, VR headset, or even just log onto a website, you're speaking to a customer service agent, could it look like this? We are thrilled to showcase an immersive and dynamic interaction between a player Kai and a non-playable character named Jin. This captivating ramen shop scene was created by NVIDIA using the latest RTX rendering technologies. NVIDIA collaborated with Convey, an NVIDIA Inception partner, to showcase how developers will soon be able to use NVIDIA Riva, Nemo, and Audio to Face for AI-powered speech, conversation, and animation. These models were integrated into the Convey Services platform and fed into Unreal Engine 5 and MetaHuman to bring Jin to life. Please take a look.
Hey, Jen. How are you? Unfortunately, not so good. How come? I am worried about the crime around here. It's gotten bad lately. My ramen shop got caught in the crossfire. Can I help? If you want to do something about this, I have heard rumors that the powerful crime lord Kuman Aoki is causing all sorts of chaos in the city. He may be the root of this violence. I'll talk to him. Where can I find him? I have heard he hangs out in the underground fight clubs on the city's east side. Try there. Okay, I'll go. Be careful, Kai. Right, <clears throat> so what you just saw was a relatively organic interaction between a human and, and a computer system of some sort. And I think this is what NVIDIA thinks of when we say metaverse. Our perspective on the metaverse is a lot more industrial. So we're talking about how organizations, ministries, building bodies can leverage digital twins of the physical world to really accelerate the entire build cycle. So what are the advantages that NVIDIA has as we work with pretty much some of the world's largest, most innovative companies and organizations is we get a bird's eye view into what's being built, who's doing what with our technology and with the technological landscape in general. So what's happened is actually, and as, a, you know, as we speak about design, NVIDIA builds platforms, we build ecosystems. So when we saw that the ecosystem that was developing or designing digital twins were facing a few issues, four factors allowed us to build this particular ecosystem at this point in time. The first thing is the actual open USD file format. The way to think of that is it's the HTML of the uh, metaverse ecosystem. It's an open standard that Pixar designed and we've been active proponents of. So this allows you to use any data assets across your favorite tool and bring it to a central point. The second factor was that a lot of the rendering that we're able to do today is actually approaching photorealistic, if not exceeding it in some cases, right? The third thing is it's happening in a time span that's actually workable. It doesn't take you years to make a feature film or some of these photorealistic scenes are rendered in real time. And the fourth factor is that the AI ecosystem itself is quite mature. So when we say metaverse, what we imagine is a, is a, is a 3D or a digital twin environment of a physical uh, situation where every asset within that has a degree of fidelity that you can control. Whether that means how much dust gets accumulated on the bonnet of your car, to whether how strong an electromagnetic signal propagates through a studio environment, or whether it's even something as interesting as how climate erodes uh, building structures, right? So the other thing that we found out is artists, we spoke about turpentine. So artists and their tools have a huge impact on the final outcome and product quality. So one of the decisions we made is to make sure that any tool that you use today in your existing workflow gets baked into the Omniverse ecosystem. So whether you're using Autodesk or Unity or Unreal Engine, you can stick to that. The open USD file format allows you to continue using it. The second thing we found is that when organizations try and build digital twins, when they engage in the metaverse, they often have this multidisciplinary silo. So the AI engineers, the data scientists are not creatives. And a lot of the creative professionals don't have rigorous statistical uh, training. So how do you kind of allow them to speak to each other? How do you allow them to design a wheel that behaves according to its uh, uh, physical properties, the rigidity that goes into it? How do you, you know, model wear and tear, right? So the second confluence here is to allow existing AI engineers to work in this digital twin environment. And we're seeing this being adopted across the board. And I was trying to figure out which one of the use cases would be a great fit, because we've built digital twins. We've got Earth 2, which is a full-blown realistic model simulation of the entire Earth and the climate systems. Um, and, and I picked something which I felt would be a good fit for, for this particular theorem, and, and that's uh, the work that we did with Ericsson. So bear in mind that when you're rolling out 5G in an urban environment, you would take a physical rover, drive it through the streets of the city, 
and basically measure the signal across each point to identify bottlenecks, blind spots, and what have you. Now imagine doing this for every single city that you're ruling this out on. With Omniverse, and you're building a metaverse environment in that, you can simulate that, which brings down your costs and your time taken to do this rollout by orders of magnitude. Okay, so let's take a quick look. There are 15 million 5G microcells and towers planned for global deployment in the next five years. Ericsson is using NVIDIA Omniverse to build digital twin environments to help determine how to place and configure each of their sites for the best coverage and network performance. In Omniverse, Ericsson builds city-scale models that are physically accurate down to the materials of the buildings, vegetation, and foliage. Then, wireless network components are added including the precise location, height, and antenna pattern of each transmitter. Ericsson built a custom Omniverse extension, enabling them to integrate radio propagation data and leverage Omniverse's RTX accelerated ray tracing to quickly visualize and calculate the quality of the signal at every point in the city. Because Omniverse materials are physically accurate, the intensity of reflections are precisely determined. Antenna beam forming and signal paths can be accurately simulated and visualized. In the simulations, the lobes signify transmitter antenna beam forming and the straight lines are signal paths. The colors of the signal paths denote strength in decibels and data throughput, from blue is the weakest to red is the strongest. Visualization is a critical capability for Ericsson. With Omniverse VR, network engineers can virtually explore any part of the model, teleporting to any location, anywhere in the world, at one-to-one -one scale. As they tune the network for optimal performance or identify path disruptions, they can literally see the effects of their adjustments in real time, things which aren't visible in real life. In Omniverse, Ericsson can perform true-to-reality remote simulation of entire 5G networks, enabling them to design more efficient and reliable networks, conduct remote field trials, and speed up deployments. Right, so imagine being able to do that. So imagine warehouses being designed to measure how much heat you propagate. So I had this very interesting discussion where you said, we're looking to replicate autonomous warehouses. How much light should we allow inside? Because depending on the area that you have within the warehouse that has inventory and where you optimize your perishables, it gets really complex. So all of that, you can do this speed of iteration in these digital environments. So I guess as, as a final close up, I mean, a lot of people don't understand what NVIDIA does in this region. So just drop us a line and we're more than happy to help. We're basically building the future uh, of design with you as well. Okay, so with that, I'll hand the floor back to Ming. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deb. I don't know if your mind's blown, mine slightly. But for our third speaker, we see how all this technology is powering new experiences. I don't know if you saw um, one of the enabling techs and they talked about Unreal Engine. I think Kay might talk about that later. We have Kay Vassi as our third speaker. Kay is a tech lawyer turned entrepreneur in the extended reality space. And extended reality is sort of a bucket term that includes augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. I'll let her explain it. Her company, Mesh Minds, has created immersive experiences with partners such as Netaportaire, Meta, World Wildlife Fund, building climate awareness and cultural literacy in youth and online communities. Kay and her company has spearheaded Sky Farm Island, Roblox's first vertical farming game set in Asia, to motivate children to cultivate and consume healthy produce, and Aquasia, a meta world inspiring young minds about future human habitats and rising sea levels. And Kay also provides strategic guidance on metaverse education, digital sustainability, transformation, and the future of art and creativity. Kay, you. Awesome, thank you very, very much indeed, Ming. And really, really awesome that you're all still here and you're awake. 
Fuck, yay. Um, so, and it's also really, really nice to hear the, the M word. Um, you know, sometimes metaverse is a bit of a dirty word. Sometimes people have already declared it's dead. Well, I'm here to also reaffirm it's very much not dead. It's very much here to stay. And there are amazing things coming. So I want to walk you through a little bit of pioneering immersive and interactive storytelling in this region. And Mesh Minds is all about art and tech for good. And six years ago, I decided, right, that's it. I can't be bothered with my technology law um, career anymore. I need to do something for people and planet. I've got two little kids at home, and I'm seeing loads of loads of kind of horrible, um, kind of climate uh, anxiety-inducing news. What can I actually do to change all of this? So I've created Mesh Minds, which is the creative studio that creates campaigns, experiences, but I also felt I need to create a foundation that then helps um, this region to be educated, empowered, and enabled to then also create experiences for themselves. So this is what drives me every single day. How can we protect our culture and the environment in this crazy digital age that we are living in? And my answer to that is, we need to empower creators to design immersive experiences that create positive change for people and planet. So, how do we dive, dive into Sky Farm Island? Now, I said, I've got two little kids, 11 and 9. And they were coming home to me going like, oh, wow, you know, did you know how the airport works, uh, what everyone does at the airport, the, uh, the, air, the pilot, the air traffic control, etc." I'm like, oh, cool, did you learn this at school? No, I was playing airport simulator on Roblox. <laughs> okay. The other one, who's a nine at the time, he was eight, coming to me saying, oh, um, I know exactly how uh, honey is made, what a beekeeper does, how pollination takes place. Oh, cool, again, right, you've been learning that at school. No, bee simulator on Roblox, where you can be the bee as well as the beekeeper. I'm like, this is incredible, right? These little kids are so, telling me so with so much passion and power what they've been learning on a platform like Roblox. What is this? And I need to take a look. So here we go. This is Roblox in numbers then. So this is where I started, like, oh my goodness, discovering. You've got 65 million daily active users, right? That's a lot of people, if you even think about how many people are in Singapore, right? Then you've got Roblox paying out $600 million for their to, to developers. And you're also saying it's not just for little kids anymore, right? Yes, 53% of those, the audience are over 13, but 17 to 24, that's the highest growing age group. So I was also inspired to think, well, what is the, pro the problem that I want to get involved with? Now, we all know, I'm sure, that Singapore has quite resource poor and we have a commitment to have 30% of our nutritional needs grown in Singapore by 2030. It's 2023. There's not very much time, but we are ahead of the game. Does anyone know what Timasic rice is? Have anyone heard of it? A couple of people in the audience, right? That blows your mind, right? That actually, Timasic rice is actually a thing. We have grown rice in Tampanese, up the side of an HDB block. And I know it's not much, it's not gonna feed everyone here, but it's the start. And if we can do it once, we can do it and scale it up many, many more times over. So I kind of thought, hmm, if all of the HDB blocks in Singapore are going to eventually have a vertical farm growing up the side of them, don't we need to tell kids that what that is, that they can actually get involved. It's your community farm. It's up the side of the block. Did you know that you can actually grow things without soil? What's hydroponics? What's aquaponics? Is there a fun way of me being able to tell you what these things are? And a little bit more digging, I found a study that said those who grow at home or at school are up to five times more likely to eat vegetables. It kind of makes sense, right? The kids are not going to be like, what's that horrible green thing? If you've actually planted it yourself, you might be like, hey, no way, it comes out green, it's from the, plant, the earth. I could actually just pop it in my mouth and taste what it is, that little Thai basil leaf or whatever it is, right? So that's where the kernel of the idea came from. And this is what I'd want to show you. Let's take a look at a little video.
Okay, there you can have it. So, what we did was we, much, much like Deb was just telling us about digital twins, really important to really look at what's happening in companies. How can we make a digital twin of giving everyone their own little HDB block, making sure that we can get our quest from the Hawker Center so that when you go to the little laxar man, he's like, go and bring me 10 chili patty and 10 laxar leaves and come back for your reward. Um, we also mean to make sure that we have different types of soil planters, hydroponics, aquaponics. We also need to make sure that uh, this one, we have the black soldier fly facility because we also talk to some people in the food industry and they said yes in future in every single HDB block and also hawker centers we are going to have these food waste gathering stations and we're going to make it into fertilizer like okay great then let's tell our kids that that is exactly what is happening and this is how they can get involved not only at the community level but also perhaps you might want to get into agritech as a, as a, a career in, in, in future okay so this is also you know, a kind of recap of why we did it, um, what we've um, um, focused on. And really, I wanted to share that quote with you. We hope to see in every student an eco-steward for life. If you can get them young, then that is going to be our, our, the paving the way to the future of getting every single child to care about people on our planet in Singapore and in Asia. So that's that one. And we have another one to share with you. So, this is Equasia. This is designed in Unreal Engine. This was actually um, inspired by a talk that I went to by Dr. Um, Benjamin Horton. And he showed me a, a, a film called Polar Impact Asia. Now, I don't know if many people also know in the audience that when the ice caps melt, it's not just a problem for, oh, I guess the polar bears and the people who live in Greenland. Sadly not. The tilt of the Earth means that all of that water is rushing to the equator, so that we have a very, very much larger problem in Asia about rising sea levels. So I'm doing some more research, thinking about it, oh my goodness, coming across this horrible statistic that out of the 200 million people that are going to be directly affected by rising sea levels, researchers are estimating that it's majority countries in Asia. So, how do we bring this across, though? Not giving like, this massive climate anxiety to our young people, but actually giving them hope for the future. So we worked with Metamo Industries, who are incredible Unreal Engine developers, to build this world which we imagined, this imaginary marine utopia that might have to be built one day for all of the climate refugees in this region who have lost everything. But fear not. We have very clever people today who are working on the future of food, energy, and transport systems that you, as a young person, might be able to get involved in designing too. So through a virtual reality experience, we want to spark these conversations and catalyze that action and get people to really take note about what is the future of human habitats in the face of rising sea levels in Asia. So let's take, oh, sorry, this one is, uh, this is all about um, the Fortnite in numbers. So thinking through how do we date the virtual reality experience and then make it more because not everyone has access to headsets. So our dream is to then bring it into Fortnite to then be able to grab the 25 million daily active users who are there and offer people experiences where they can kind of explore Equasia, play mini games inside them, and whilst they're having fun, learning loads at the same time about the future of human habitats. So let's take a look at this one. Journey with us to an imaginary marine utopia Reimagine today's food, energy, and transport in a floating city of the future.
discover breakthrough technologies that harness the power of nature and support clean, circular, sustainable lifestyles. Welcome to Future Living. Welcome to Equasia. So really, you see, our hope here is that we might be able to offer this as a new platform to brands to be able to say, oh, actually, you've already made a world. I'd like to really tell my sustainability story to young people. Can I get inside your world rather than having to build a whole new one myself? So this is our dream in relation to hosting perhaps virtual exhibitions inside there. Perhaps could you imagine a product showcase? For example, one of our dreams would be to contact Adidas and say, hey, you know, you've got an ocean plastic shoe. How about you come into Equasia in Fortnite, and then together players can then go and discover the different parts of ocean plastic that you use, or even the shoes themselves, and to collaboratively we'll all get them together, and then at the end, we'll be able to unlock some kind of perhaps discount voucher that gets you something in the physical world. So all of these kind of digital experiences that connect the digital and the physical worlds, that's the kind of thing that we want to do. What about a virtual concert? Look how many people missed out on Taylor Swift and getting tickets, you know? Do you see that on, on the Travis Scott had 27 million people log in? That is astonishing in relation to bringing these cultural experiences to people who simply cannot get there physically. So, I'm down to my takeaways, ta Paula. What is the opportunity here? Don't forget the future's audience. So it's my kids, right, the, the 11 and 9 today, it's all of the digital ninjas, the generation alpha, who will be turning 18 in five years' time. We need you guys to be developing awesome experiences for this audience, who are, they, it's, what, it's where they live, it's where they want to be. In much the same way as Instagram was like, hey, you know, do lots of augmented reality and funny campaigns on Instagram because we've got such a massive audience. This is an, an audience that you must not ignore. People on Roblox and people on Fortnite. People, you, we need more experiences to be built there. Why should I care? Asian cultural representation. I cannot tell you enough, right? Think about historical games, farming games, Farmville, etc. Who features? Little white guy, straw hat on, cow's pig sheep. How is that relevant for this audience and this region? We need you to create more diverse worlds, and only Asian people can really, truly build for Asia audiences. And how do I get involved, finally? Leverage your 2D and 3D design expertise. Adapt and acquire those new skills. There's so many things that you can learn just on teaching yourself on YouTube. There's lots of people. You can join lots of different communities, people who will support you on your onward journey. And don't forget that cross-disciplinary collaboration is absolutely key. It's not something you're going to be able to do on your own, but there's loads of amazing collaborators out there waiting to work with you. We do have, still on, five more days of our awesome show. So both Sky Farm Island and Equasia are upstairs on the fourth floor at Art Science Museum. We do close on the 30th, so please, please do come down. It's all free. Historically, you know, you do have to pay for a ticket at the VR gallery. This one, no, okay? So do come down. We've had almost 10,000 people see it already. So if you haven't, miss, it, miss out, please don't. And that's me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. I hope that you enjoyed those three very different views of what technology can do, should do. And, you know, thinking about the way that design can be used to shape not just the way that tech is developed, but also how it can be deployed, how it can be used. You know, many panels start off like this, which is they've done, three people have done brilliant conversations, and then I get to ask all the questions. But I'd like to start today's conversation in a slightly different way, which is an invitation to each speaker to respond to the fantastic presentations that we have heard so far. Because you all come from different you know, perspectives of the tech world, so I want to ask each of you what resonated most with you, or is there anything that was said that you'd like to take a slightly different spin on? Maybe Kai Fong and then Deb and then Kay. Kai Fong? Yep, just reacting to what Kay just presented, I think this was... Uh, something that struck me was how games and immersion sort of just puts you 
right smack in the middle of uh, you know, in a, 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 the future, right? And in that sense, it sort of inculcates a certain empathy that I think we need to start inculcating in everyone. If we really want to make a, a change and start a movement, I think more, more immersion, more empathy would be good. So kudos to that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I, I think the future is now, and how do you get to see that the future is now, mm -hmm. is to actually be able to envision that. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, Deb, anything that struck you in particular? Yeah, I think I really enjoyed um, both presentations. They're fantastic. Um, but specifically for, for Kai Feng, I think um, when you were chronicling the journey of designing that entire voucher scheme, I think three things really struck me, which is firstly was that it's, it's very iterative. Product design is very iterative. And I think any framework or structure that enables iterations to have a productive outcome tends to have a big difference between really successful products versus things that aren't. The other thing that was always present in that entire journey was the human in the loop. Like it had a very clear identity of what the product wanted to be and the features that it was bringing in were very nicely coupled with the gaps. So you're talking about senior citizens who are unable to use specific parts of the technology. So I think that second glue, which, which is the user in mind, the user persona, was really important. And I think the third thing, which I think was left unsaid, is, is that the product got delivered in time. Right? So you know, we're, we're not still iterating. You know, COVID was relatively short, so in that time frame, to have these many real life experiments and iterations and still have a product go out to market, I think these are three things that are hallmarks of really good uh, product design. So that re really shot out of that to me. So awesome, thanks. Ted, maybe I can just ask you to explain the technical. You mentioned human in the loop, right? And in AI, these are some very important concepts, sort of yeah. human in the loop, human over the loop, et cetera. Maybe you can just expand on that a little bit for the audience. Sure. Um, so whenever we look at designing systems, um, we think about um, especially when you're incorporating machine learning or AI uh, within any system, you always try and think about which parts of the system can be accelerated first. So you, you've got to have a very clear idea of the end-to-end -end user flow for a product. And then you pick and choose parts of that pipeline that you want to bootstrap and accelerate. Uh, some of that could be automation. So for example, for really small micro decisions, you are looking at for example, safety detection, or you're, you're saying there's a particular event that you wish to classify as fraudulent, you could automate that. At the same time, human in the loop is a constant within all of these design paradigms, because you're saying who's going to validate the quality of that decision? Who's accountable for owning what the decision looks like in the first place? So it's always essential, it's a hallmark of high quality products, even AI products, to have a human-centric perspective as you're designing them. So that's what I mean when I say human in the loop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Kay, any thoughts on what Deb or, or Kai Fong brought up? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely love that ramen shop. <laughs> it's like incredible, right? And that, that really blew my mind in relation to what we could potentially do in future with Equasia, right? When you marry meta humans and AI and Unreal Engine, where you have um, you know, quite realistic looking characters, very realistic looking environments, those digital twins that you were mentioning, you can have something absolutely really, really powerful. And when you think about how you, um, you know, historically have created uh, AAA games, et cetera, the amount of work that has to go into that in creating the, all of the scripts, et cetera, et cetera, and now you can supercharge that with AI, that is really such an exciting, um, you know, advent that we are kind of at the precipice of. Um, and then in relation to what Kai Fong said, in I just love the fact that the build for good, right? It's so important also to us to always be asking like little kids, like, well, what would you like to see in this world? How would you like to grow plants? How would, what would you like a magical plant to do? Um, so I think it's really, really important to keep on having those um, discussions with the actual people who will be using the tech at the end as well. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. Let me just delve a little bit deeper into each of your perspectives on the role of the design for emerging tech. I'd like to start with Deb now. Um, you talked about that developer ecosystem. You talked about keeping your ear close to the ground and understanding what's happening out there because no one has a monopoly on, 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 on knowledge. No one has a monopoly on what the future will, will look like. So 
for NVIDIA in general, and perhaps yourself in particular, in all of your different roles, you've, there's been this thread of being a supporter of a developer ecosystem, right, in harnessing AI. Because AI is actually just, uh, it's, it's a general enabling technology. It's like, how do you harness the future of the printing press? Actually, there's so many applications of a printing press, which is the general enabler. So in harnessing the potential of AI, what do you think is needed to build a strong ecosystem which brings all of these different skill sets together? And in particular, what potential can you see in cross-disciplinary collaborations with the design community? And in the panel before, they talk about interdisciplinary collaborations, which are slightly different from cross-disciplinary collaborations with the design community. How do you see that developing? No, it, it's a fantastic question. Something, I mean, it, it's something that I'm extremely passionate about, and, and I'll try and pick out three threads here. Mm. So, so one of them is how do you forge a high-quality developer ecosystem across any discipline? You know, AI is, is one factor, but how do you kind of build, what are the raw ingredients get that go into it? Um, and the second part could be about where we talk about uh, interdisciplinary and cross uh, disciplinary. I think that relates more to diversity and of thinking within any, in, any discipline. So, so forging a high quality developer ecosystem, I think you have to have strong foundational fundamental skills in, in your discipline of choice. So I get asked a lot of questions, like a very common question for me in, in a lot of these panels is, hey, if you had to pick three skills to engage in AI, what would they be? And I say, I tend to say, pick, pick three, right? Pick a good, strong mathematical subset. So nothing super crazy, but just make sure you know your A, A plus, your one plus ones and two plus twos to some degree, right? Second is pick a tool of choice. And this, this spreads across the board. So if you're a programmer, you pick a programming language of choice. If you're a creative, pick a tool of choice. But this has to go in, hand in hand with your fundamental technology choice. You don't want to be limited by the tool. It has to be an extension of the knowledge you wish to utilize. And the third thing is any developer ecosystem always benefits from having strong participation elements. So AI is not a spectator sport. Uh, a lot of, um, and we've seen this, there's a lot of knowledge work and a lot of influencers who read one or two medium blog posts and then you know, multiply and escalate that by, by, by 100. Um, you're not going to get too much value out of it. So there's a lot of value in actually just getting your hands dirty and participating in the ecosystem. So these are the three hallmarks that we look for. Strong foundational skills, focus in, in, in product quality, and participation. So these are three hallmarks that we see. Um, the second kind of issue which speaks about cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary issues, uh, thinking this is... Um, one of the best hires that I've made, uh, I've hired data scientists across the board for the last decade or so, one of the best hires I made was a uh, young lady, she was a politics, uh, she, she majored in politics. Right? Uh, she enjoyed what she was doing, but she wanted to pivot into data science and analytics at that point in time. Amazing. She, had tr she approached problems for a very different point. She had a very interesting perspective when she approached a specific problem, she would say, hey, she, she thought about the humanities perspective of it, right? So I think interdisciplinary um, skill sets, diversity of thought is something that always adds value, especially in these decision science outcomes. So don't be frightened. Don't be uh, frightened. You, you can do it. <laughs> Thank you. Kay, I just Maybe, want to build on... Should I just react something? to that? Yes, of course. Should I just react to that? No, because what NVIDIA has done, and I think that maybe look at all the tech companies in uh, developer relations and building an ecosystem is something that... Uh, in government, we are just you know beginning to try to learn how learn from them, uh, because traditionally in government, at least in the Singapore government, you know you complain to the government and the government tries to fix it, right? You know, and if it doesn't have resources to fix it, it says okay, please wait, right? But uh, we want to change the game a little, right? Because I think with all these tools right now, actually we want to work with you and empower you to to take things in your own hands and try to. That's why we, we launched Build for Good, right? You complain, you have an issue that's bugging you. Uh, don't just tell us, why not work together with us? We equip you with, you know, we have our own designers, we have our own programmers, let's work in a team. Let's try to work it out in a hackathon or something. Uh, and the way we do it, 
it's a little bit like developer tools also, right? We try to build tools so that people can actually self-serve. Uh, so at least within government, what we do, what we do is now uh, we try to build the building blocks for, for you to build your own solutions. So in this team, for example, during COVID, they needed to build a tool to enable you to collect information from uh, citizens. Because actually, believe it or not, there's no solution out there that allows you to have an end-to-end -end encrypted way to send information to the government. Uh, besides, it's either PDF or Google Docs. So they built forms.sg, right? You need a way to communicate the citizens. And again, that didn't exist in the market, so you build it. But as you build all these tools, then you actually have a toolkit in which uh, you are enabling people to build and to solve problems on their own. And that's, I guess, uh, what we can learn from all, all the tech companies like NVIDIA. Thank you so much, Kai Feng. I, I love your point about you complain, you build it, right? My mom used to say there's a difference between whining and complaining. You can whine at the weather because you can't change it, but if you complain, you have to state the problem, then you yeah. can solve it. Yeah. And, and I think that's why designers are valuable in the system, right? Because designers are the ones that, I guess, uh, get so irritated with the smallest of things that they want to change, to change something to fix it, right? Exactly. And I think that's, that's, why, that's why in my talk, we talk about how we really want that movement of, you know, just being completely discontented, but also being empowered to change things. And I think in that case, although you know, engineers and designers sometimes feel like they're on different sides of the fence, there's actually a great deal in common because it's all about design, identifying the problem. Right? You can identify and you can scope the problem. Well, I think one of the speakers before talked about, you gotta get the brief right, otherwise you're not gonna get the right solution. So I think there's a lot more in common. Kay, I just wanted to bring you in, just to build on that point about the developer ecosystem. Um, you mentioned it very briefly at the beginning about Mesh Minds Foundation work in capacity building. And what you're building with your world is really an invitation to everybody to come and play, right? So what are the opportunities that you see for designers and companies and even government to work together to build an enabling environment for a uniquely Southeast Asian design and tech ecosystem that will serve our needs and our region's needs. Yeah, I mean, we've worked, um, we, you know, with uh, Meta and uh, Apple, and, and you know, it's been really, really. And, and one of the first ever um, programs I actually came across was with Autodesk and called Pier Nine, and you know, they were opening, throwing open their doors and saying, "Hey, come in, because if you're a designer, developer, etc., we can actually teach you some things because we're the ones who actually have access to the uh, early um, stage new features, etc. We can perhaps lend you some uh, software, hardware. Um, so I've always been really inspired by those." types of programs, and so that's why when we started the Mesh Minds Foundation, it was all about our, you know, please insert human, and that's what the name of our flagship program is called, whereby we have over the years taught virtual reality in China. We ran the first ever virtual reality art and animation program in China with um, Oculus. Um, you know, whereby we invited people who had never even, like they were 2D and 3D designers, never even put in a headset before, some of them, and were able to then simply squeeze their controllers and make these incredible worlds all about Chinese folklore and history and that kind of stuff. So we need to have more of these programs whereby the government can also come in. So for example, um, UOB has been working with NAC, and together they make this wonderful creative accelerator so that young um, you know, uh, art companies can be like, oh, I have no idea really about like, the entrepreneurial side of things. I'm really rubbish about the business side of things. Can you help me? Because then I can actually free up more of my time to do the creative thing, which is what I'm really, really good at. So we need more of the, the government and the companies to come together to create and support these programs so that designers, creators can come on board, learn something new, so be, you know, educate, be educated, but also be enabled, because there's no point just coming to a workshop, right? They need to be enabled as well, so they need access to the tools, whether that's software and hardware, and then they need to be empowered, because even if they've done the workshop, they've had access to the tools, if that piece of content or that experience doesn't get to see the world or get shown in the world, then they're not empowered, and they haven't, you know, that, that hasn't been seen by anyone. It just literally is gathering digital dust somewhere. So that, that's why we have that kind of three-step, educate, enable, empower. And I think if we can kind of get those three E's really kind of into the minds of governments and companies to be able to create programs like this, then that is how, and the brief, as you're saying, is set as, please do something for people and planet that features Asia in some way. 
get people to bring in their culture so that we don't just end up with another bunch of first-person shooters, zombie games, etc., that are very much set in the West and is just, you know, it will just continue to pervade. We need things that are set in environments that we are familiar with, that we can connect with as an Asian, Asian audience. No, I really loved it when you talked about the nasi champo stall, right? And uh, you're not buying... What's it you get in the farming games? You buy your strawberries, yeah, exactly. apples, and yeah. corn, or something yeah. like that, as opposed to getting chilies. Although I must say that the Indonesian zombie games are actually pretty good, <laughs> right? <laughs> Kai Fong, um, I just want to pick up that point that you know, you've already given that hint about the ecosystem and, and making um, citizens part of, the, mm -hmm. part of the solution in a way. Um, and you know, you've talked a little bit about using government, using tech to solve problems and making life better for citizens. But how do we ensure that the future of emerging tech does remain not just human-centered, but really participatory and citizen-centered? You know, I think we've kind of gone this journey, right, where it's like from e-government to digital government. But I think, you know, is that next step some kind of digitally enabled democracy? that has a different kind of relationship between government and citizen? I think it's still too early to say. Uh, I would say that uh, you're already seeing hints of that happening, right? Because now with, with the mobile phone, I guess with social media and all that, everyone sort of like, everyone has sort of supplanted what used to be the traditional uh, domain of mainstream media, let's say. So today I can easily go viral just on TikTok. So that, that sort of changed the nature of power dynamics between government and, uh, and people, right? So I think we're going to see this uh, evolve as we go along. I think what Deb was outlining in terms of having a digital twin, you know, the stuff that's happening in Fortnite and Roblox are actually causing a lot of governments to really think through what are the implications. So for example, on Roblox or on Fortnite, you know, there's a crime uh, in, in Roblox or Fortnite, does that, you know, how, how will we deal with that in the real world? These are issues. You, in your opening talk, you also talked about how the generative, generative AI, we're going to see a lot more disinformation and misinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so as part of my other portfolio, I know that this is something that we are uh, really concerned about. But at the same time, uh, it's not just about regulation, not just about uh, the uh, censorship in that sense. But actually, we can use tech to solve some of the problems. So for example, if we are talking about disinformation and misinformation, actually, uh, we will then not need to start thinking, OK, do I need a national identity system? You know, today, we have Singh Pass. Can that perform the role of, let's say, a proof of personhood or proof of humanity? Because increasingly, if you believe that uh, what generative AI does is not just read, but also write. In other words, they can be so-called your bots or your agents acting on your behalf. Actually, who am I to know that the person behind that screen is really a bot or a human? Yep. That's where proof of personhood, proof of humanity comes in, right? So actually, I do think that uh, it is important for all governments to sort of keep abreast and try to really get, uh, get ahead, right? And actually understand what's happening out there. And actually not just uh, solve every problem by regulation, but actually technology is a key part of that. No, absolutely. I was sitting down with uh, some folks from Google, and they were saying that I think Google's AI filters 10 million spam and yeah. phishing emails every minute. So today right? they can and do some just, content moderation, they can do, that do some filters. As a yep. human. I want to leave some time for questions. So um, the first one, um, K, wouldn't it be nice to actually teach kids to grow plants in real life, maybe at the permaculture garden from Caroline's? Uh, neighborhood rather than in a game. Was there a point in the design process to connect the educational part online to the actual output offline? Yes, awesome. You. Thank you very much for the question. Um, we are actually partnered with City Sprouts, so uh, those kids who go and show their little um, screenshot uh, can grab their own uh, game, uh, sorry, their own farm tour, and also seeds to plant in real life. So it's very, very much around connecting you know, what you see in the game and also then trying to inspire you to do that in real life. So definitely, um, inside the game, you have a kind of like, um, like you 
kind of go close to these little uh, information points as well. So as you pop up next to the uh, Black Soldier Fly facility, for example, it will tell you exactly what it is. Um, each of the, when you plant everything, it'll say like, you know, chili paddy, it'll give you a little fact about it and a fun fact as well. Um, there's magical parts of the game as well though, so we don't want it just purely educational, like, oh, I'm so bored in this game. But there needs to be, for example, you know, when you plant the dragon fruit for five minutes, you then have loads of fire behind you. When you plant the star fruit, similarly, you have stars coming out from behind you. So um, it's very much around kind of like trying to keep that balance of actually inspiring kids to plant in real life. Because as I said, it's very important to us to then try to establish a causal link between you have played this game, you've actually been inspired to plant at home, and then hopefully, as studies show, you will then eat those vegetables as well. So it's very much around for us for trying to marry the physical and the digital. Thank yeah, you. I think we underestimate the potential, right? Because I think what technology enables you to do is not just time shift. In other words, you know, plants grow in like one minute rather than years. And also place shift, right? You can grow plants, you can go into environments where you know, normally you won't have access to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We've had a lot of tech positive conversations in the last what, about hour or so. But we have some really, I think, thoughtful challenges here. Deb. How can digital twinning help us be more energy efficient in reducing the impact on Earth? And isn't there a conflict between using advanced tech, which uses loads and loads of resources, minerals, and energy, as heard in the previous panel, and sustainability? No, that, that's an awesome question. I think, um, thank you to have asked that. So I think it's, it's important not to look at these things in isolation. So there's two questions here. One of them is about how can you use AI and digital twins to make processes more efficient. I think the second question is, how much energy are you consuming and does, does that, is that justified, right? So yes, absolutely, the first one, I think, you know, I just showed you in, in the earlier demo, just one example. Um, so for example, each of these cities that you then drive a physical, possibly fossil fuel powered vehicle, or maybe a fleet of fossil fuel powered vehicles through the cities, you're saving up on that, right? You're basically saving up on having dummy towers installed in each of these uh, buildings, and then you bring that down, right? So that you can put a real tower in place. So that process is being made much more efficient, and you're doing this globally. Right? So by utilizing digital twins strategically, you are making processes more efficient, and that has its own energy savings. For example, one of the other exam, uh, use cases we've seen is with BMW, who are using digital twins inside their factory. It's highly modular, highly robotic. Uh, they are planning out which robots get placed in what order so that every single vehicle that they manufacture becomes more efficient. Right? So there's a tremendous amount of work that's already been done globally by pretty much every industry to make processes more efficient. Um, but the second question about you know, the energy that's being used. So if you're kind of using NVIDIA GPUs, for example, you get about 65 gigaflops per watt. Compare that with traditional CPU-based um, compute that comes to about two to three gigaflops per watt. So the wattage energy for innovation that you get by using advanced technology is more efficient. So I think these are, these are absolutely essential themes to address, uh, and it's something that we take very seriously. Great, thank you so much. Kai Fong, this is another question, is about learning, I think. Were there any digital, government digital product that didn't work out? Because sometimes we learn more Absolutely not. when things don't no, work. Everything works well. <laughs> <laughs> That didn't work out after its launch, what happened and did it lead to the development of any other? I think we can, uh, there are plenty of product, products that we kill and, and you have to, right? This is a function of just progress and a function of A-B testing. But maybe uh, in relation to what I presented earlier, one, uh, so the jury's still quite mixed on this, but I think in my own personal opinion, I must qualify that as a government servant, uh, one digital product that didn't work out, I say this with some hesitance because it's, you know, I know the CEO of the agency is here. Uh, <laughs> for example, it's the Singapore Rediscovers vouchers, right? You know, in the, where we sort of uh, wanted to give Singaporeans again some money to spend at, uh, you know, dedicated so-called tourist attractions, visits, and all that. Uh, that was a tremendously clunky process. You know, you need to sing pass, you need to 
you know, you, you, you probably had to run a marathon before you could actually claim the vouchers or something, right? And you can tell, actually, not just by own personal experience, but you can also tell by, in terms of metrics, right? How much of it was used, uh, who was using it, uh, which agencies benefited, that sort of thing. And I think uh, it is important for every, every tech agency, every government as well, to, to really have a, an objective view based on the metrics. Uh, because sometimes, actually, the, the trouble in government, especially hierarchical organizations like the government, is that you know, the, the, the most senior person in the room sort of decides whether the product is successful or, fail, or fails, right? That shouldn't be the case. Uh, and I think in this case, you know, I, I guess the learnings from that also helped us uh, think through you know, uh, what sort of vouchers we need for what kind of people, right? So what I described in the, in the redeem voucher, that's not for every voucher, right, if you think about it. That's really when you want mass distribution, 100% of the population, uh, you want to cater to the less savvy people. On the flip side, we actually have other vouchers, like uh, if, you are, if you serve national service, NSMEN, uh, that's traditionally much more tech-savvy, digital, digitally enabled, so that's a completely different way in which we deliver the vouchers. But what's important is that we, you know, we are objective and we don't, uh, we don't shirk from killing products, even though, you know, you know, even though maybe the... A senior guy said, no, just do this. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I definitely, that's, that's part of the iterative approach. Just to wrap up very quickly, you know, I think one of the things that we really resonated here was basically how do you define success? Certainly not the most senior person. Utilization, uptake, adoption. Um, Deb, I love what you talked about, how technology needs to be universal, accessible, right, and inclusive. Um, and protecting culture and environment in a digital age, that our physical world and our histories are absolutely important to define our futures. What do we need to be able to do that, building that culture of experimentation um, that Kai Fong talked about, it, being really close to the ground and understanding who's doing what, um, that you mentioned, and empowering the creators through education um, and enabling them and being able to have that cross-collaboration. Um, I just want to, we're out of time, but I want to just have one more beauty queen quick fire round, <laughs> right, to each of you in 30 seconds or less, um, in terms of what this audience can take away. What would you like the design community to take away from today's conversation in terms of the design community's role in enabling tech for good? Uh, Kay, Deb, and then Kai Fong. Um, I always say I, I'm, I'm 44, right? So I'm super old. Um, and you know, I've just seen, you know, web one, web two, web three, right? So in web one, everyone was like, hey, you don't have a website yet? God, you know, better get on with it. Web two was all about, hey, you're not on social media yet? Oh, you better get on with it. You know, get your Facebook, your in Instagram, et cetera. For generation alpha, web three and beyond, it's going to be, their question is going to be, you don't have a virtual world for me to explore your brand, et cetera. And so that's where you guys can come in. Really, really designing these incredible worlds that will bring all of the brands and tech for good and all of that kind of call to action to life. Thank you. Deb? Well, <clears throat> I think... Um, there's a role to be played in terms of making sure you have enough information to be more than dangerous. Right? There's this anecdote of the CEO of a watch, you know, of a clock company came in and said the best way to optimize is to make sure that we're building both hands of the same length. Makes for very efficient supply chain logistics. I don't think that company is around anymore, right? So I think a role that the design community can play, especially as you're participating in this dare I say, unholy confluence of technology and futurism and uh, life-changing, species-changing uh, technological interventions, uh, make sure you know enough to be more than dangerous, which means don't be literate, don't just be literate, be educated on AI and tech. Thank you very much. Kai Fong. Uh, just simple, just uh, join us in solving problems. <laughs> <laughs> be part of the, so don't be part of the problem and be part of the solution. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Please join me, everybody, in thanking this brilliant panel with the Chung Kai Fong, Deb Goswami, and Kay Basi for your generous sharing today. Thank you.